Yeah, let's uh, let's pivot now to a discussion of nasomaxillary expansion because I know that's also something that you've carved a little uh, niche out for yourself in through your uh, your mind procedure, which is a kind of uh, special uh, surgical assist to uh, the nasomaxillary expansion. And then uh, from what I've gathered by talking to some of your patients, the use of a custom MARPI uh, to complement that surgical assist that you do. So could you tell us uh, what is the MIND? What does that stand for? And then what are the technical aspects of that surgical assist? What does it involve? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, the MIND technique stands for minimally invasive nasomaxillary distraction. Um, it uh, now utilizes a custom RP, but in the early days, I've been doing this for like five years now. Uh, it used to use just a regular MSE um, to do it. But um, basically, it's a, like you said, it's a surgical assist to achieve maxillary expansion. So, you know, um, that's a that's a long talk we can have maybe part of today, but maybe a whole episode because maxillary expansion is a uh, something I'm very passionate about. Um, and there's a lot of intricacies in it. But basically, um, especially in the old days, it was very hard to get a lot of people to split with just an MSC, for example. And um, I was doing a lot of SARPs and domes and stuff like that, which are good procedures, but they have their down their, their downfalls, right? It's a pretty big operation. You're doing a two-piece Lefort one osteotomy. So it's a big incision, big dissection, and you know, therefore a pretty big recovery. Um, and then the type of expansion you're getting is although you know you're gaining space for the tongue by winding the palate and you know you're expanding the volume of alveolar bone if they have crowding and whatever but you're only really expanding the floor of the nose so while you do get improvements in nasal breathing it was kind of not the most ideal in terms of airway and um i had you know read the paper by cantarella where they were showing how in kids you are getting mid-face expansion with MARPs when they did 3D superimpositions of the pre and post-op CBCTs. And, um, and then I read um, uh, uh, Casey Lee's paper on ease, and I started doing the ease procedure, uh, which is a really good procedure. Uh, so I was doing, I was doing ease uh, endoscopically through the nose and releasing the pterygomaxillary junction and, and using the KLS expander and all that. And I, and I, and I liked it, but I, I, uh, you know, I was like, I think I can do this split a little bit more predictably and easier if I do it all transorally. So instead of doing it endoscopically through the nose, I'm like, I'm an oral surgeon. I can probably, I know in my head how I can accomplish the surgery a little bit more predictably through the mouth, but I wanted to keep it minimally invasive. I didn't want, you know, to, you know, I thought, you know, I, I don't want this to be a big operation like a SARPI or like a dome. And um, I, I developed a technique through three little incisions in the mouth. So they're literally each half inch big at most. Um, and I perform four cuts. So I, I do the mid palatal split, complete mid palatal split, ANS to PNS, so anterior nasal spine to posterior nasal spine. So um, from, just to provide some visuals, so uh, from here to here? Correct, um, but full thickness. So not just, I know a lot of people do surgical assist by PAs owing just the midline of the palate from the mouth. Um, that's not where people get stuck in my, in my opinion. Um, but it's the full thickness of the palate. Uh, so if you imagine flipping, can you flip that down? Yeah. So that way all the way back. So between the two central incisors all the way back. Um, so, you, so you chisel, you chisel, do you chisel down or do you cut? Down? Uh, mostly with a piezo. So piezo, uh, I use a piezo, but I'm not traumatizing the palate. So the palate, the palatal mucosa is completely intact. Everything's done through a little half inch incision here. I also separate the pterygomaxillary junction yep, on each side. So there'll be another small incision there where I'll separate the pterygomaxillary junction. And then I'll also separate the nasal septum of the maxillary crest. So the septum attaches to the crest. 
I've never had a, you know, you can't see the septum there too easily, but if you imagine the nasal septum would attach to the maxilla. Here, inside of the nose. <clears throat> on the floor of the nose. Yeah. yeah. So I'll free the septum from the, from the maxilla. Uh, the reason being is when you're in my world, I'm, you know, I've seen every one else's complications, you know? So I've seen people that have expanded in their septum went off to one side. Uh, I don't know if you've... Is that what causes the nostrils to look different when you look at them from underneath and you see can. sometimes? Yeah. Yes, yeah. You get like a small nostril and then a big gaping nostril? It's one of the reasons, yeah. So so I've, I've, I've had people that had expansion other places and they came in like this. Does the whole part, the whole soft part of the nose tip? No, just the sept, the, yeah, the septum and then everything distorts with it. Mm. So while I'm there, I have access to the septum. Uh, so I free the septum up just to take that out of the equation so that when they expand, you know, sometimes the septum can attach to one half of the maxilla. And then during expansion, that septum can follow that half of the maxilla and distort the nose. So I free the septum to make sure that it doesn't follow any half of the maxilla during expansion. And then I perform those cuts. I make sure that everything is super passive and mobile. So during the mind surgery, there's no ambiguity there. I expand people probably four millimeters or so. They get a huge diastema. I know, you know, I know that everything is, is, is moving as symmetrically and smooth as possible. And, you know, a lot of that is, over the years, I've developed a feel for how an expander should feel without being under resistance. And then I close them back up. We give it about five to seven days for a callus to form. And then we begin the distraction on osteogenesis process. After a callus to form on the palatal mucosa? The palatal suture. So the there's going to be a fracture that forms on the two halves. Uh, so what you want to do is wait about five to seven days for a callus to form between the two halves of the bone. And then you begin stretching the callus out. Right. And then you hold it for, you know, four to six months. And then that callus should ossify and turn into bone. Yeah. Yeah. And you said you, you get about four millimeters of expansion the same day. Yeah. But I close it back up. So I get that four millimeters or so just to know that the surgery is a success. I don't want them. I don't want to be, tr I, I, I've been fooled. Let's put it that way. So, you know, school of the hard knocks, right? So, you know, you, you can get fooled by a one millimeter diastema during surgery and be like, Oh, they're split. And then when they start turning at home, they, they, they plateau at that one millimeter and get stuck. Uh, so I want to, I want to make sure that everything is, guaranteed to be split and open and passive then i close them back up so the four millimeters is a rough number but it's until i know that everything is 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 has worked well and uh, when you say you close them back up you're then you're closing up the soft tissue on the roof of the mouth so that that can begin to heal i never touch the soft tissue on the roof of the mouth so, How do you prevent uh, that issue that often happens in marpy cases where if you expand too soon after the piezo assist the palatal mucosa never heals because it starts spreading with the bone and then it never really. Closes. Yeah. So that's why I, I don't, I don't do, I don't cut the palatal mucosa. Oh, you do the, you do the whole midline. Everything is, through everything here? is done. Everything is done through a small incision right here. Oh, wow. So. That's very clever. Yeah. So, the, cause I don't, I don't want people to develop a fistula between their, their mouth and their nose. Um, so I, my goal is to keep the palatal mucosa completely intact because you can, you can develop a fistula if you start expanding after you traumatize the palatal mucosa. So with my surgery, the palatal mucosa is intact the whole time and you never have to worry about it. But besides that, I don't think people really get the, the bone in the midline of the palate, like where people are doing those surgical assists. I mean, maybe it helps a little bit, but that's not where people get stuck the most that's that's you know a couple millimeter three millimeter thick bone that's not where they're getting stuck yeah w where are they getting stuck in in these other places here yeah you have to go here. you have to go full thickness all the way back like mm -hmm. uh if you're not going full thickness all the way back you can still get stuck what's your opinion on lateral buttress wedging um and uh the the two pen method that michael hutz does 
Chicago, he says that he likes to wedge this this nook here because this can be a major source of resistance. I I, I don't touch there. You don't find um, that to be a problem. No. And I have hundred percent success rate uh, now. Uh, you know, in the early days when I was when I was fine tuning the procedure, I, I, I'm not going to lie. You know, there's a couple cases that that. I told you I got fooled on or I'm like, oh, they are split. And then, you know, I had to try again or, or whatever. But, um, you know, in the last three years, I haven't had a patient not split. I, I don't I don't touch the buttresses, the max, uh, zygomatical maxillary buttresses, because I want mid-face expansion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for, no for, so for me, like the whole point of my procedure is to get true like i mean it's like lefort three level expansion the whole mid face if i cut the buttresses what i'd be worried is you start getting uh, lefort one level expansion mm -hmm. so i leave the buttresses alone um i do release the terrigal maxillary junction just to make sure we don't have resistance over there and we get as much symmetrical anterior to posterior expansion as possible i'm not too familiar uh with this doctor's approach and i'd have to see scans and maybe maybe he does achieve the same expansion as me so but in, in my hands I, I don't have to do that and i get everyone to get mid-face expansion